This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Kauai, Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis-Mark, and today's guests are two of my best friends. <laughs> we have Cindy Natman from the UH Sea Grant College and Scott Rowland, who is a professor within the Geology and Geophysics Department at UH Manoa. And it's a special topic today because this is advanced publicity for the open house, which Manoa is holding this coming Friday, October the 20th, and Saturday, October 21st. It's the SOST Open House, which is a great opportunity for everybody watching live to come and come and talk to a, a scientist. And Cindy, um, yes. we've been having these open houses at Manoa for quite a few years now. So what's the goal? And tell the watchers what we're actually planning to see. Yes, aloha Pete, thanks so much for having me on the show. Uh, we've actually been having these open houses for 28 years, so this is our 14th biennial SOAST open house, and the real reason for having it is just to invite all of the public from ages 5 to 105 to come up to the University of Hawaii at Manoa campus and to really engage directly with the researchers, the faculty, the graduate students, and the staff so that they have a chance to share the really exciting research that they're doing each and every day. So there will be a lot of the, the faculty who are dropping their research for the day yes. or stopping teaching classes specifically? Do they have exhibits? Or yes, what, absolutely. The There's over 90 exhibits that are planned. And mm -hmm. like you said, the faculty and the students are all dropping everything else that they're doing that day and focusing in on the SOAS Open House because we get thousands and thousands of people that come. So it's really a wonderful opportunity for everyone to share what they're doing. OK, so this isn't the only advanced publicity which we've been having <laughs> for the Open House. Um, basically, you've already contacted what, general public, schools? We have. As a matter of fact, on Friday, that's our busiest day, and we get up to 5,000 students that are coming with their schools. So they've all signed up in advance. They come up on the buses, and um, they have a very organized day with all of the school groups. And then Saturday is much more, a um, little more relaxed, and we encourage families to come and bring their students. And a lot of people, that um, their students came on Friday, and they're so excited about it that they like to bring their parents, their siblings, to the Saturday. And Saturday is 10 a.m. to 2, 2 p.m. at the correct. campus, and Friday, is 8.30 to, to 2. two. Okay. That's correct. Yep. So this is a lot of effort, Scott, and you've been uh, a faculty member for many mm -hmm. years, and uh, you must have been through quite a few of these open mm -hmm. houses. I think I've been part of every single one, actually, <laughs> doing wow. various various activities. Uh -huh. And it's really a, a, a fun opportunity for, for uh, SOAS students and faculty and staff to show the public who pay our salaries, what we do, <laughs> and and try and get them as excited about those topics as, as we are. Okay, well, we've been talking a little bit about the, the crowns. Um, let's yeah. just go to the first image, sure. uh, which I think will give uh, the viewers a little <laughs> bit better understanding of, of what is actually laid on. And this is outside of uh, the, the, the post building. Mm -hmm. and, and Scott, you, you as the volcanologist, um, what we're looking at here is an area that seems to be roped off, and we've got... Um, a plastic dustbin. Right. You're a volcanologist. <laughs> Just give us an example of what kind of exhibit is here. Um, yeah, we've got lots of kids sat down in the foreground. What are they waiting for? They, they are waiting for an explosion. And uh, this is a demonstration of what actually drives explosive volcanic eruptions. So the type of eruptions that we don't have in Hawaii most of the time. Um, but basically, it's expanding gas. Is what is what drives a volcanic explosion, and in this case, the expanding gas is um, nitrogen that's poured into a, um, a soda bottle and allowed to go from um, liquid nitrogen form to nitrogen gas form. And when it does that, it expands a huge amount mm. and basically explodes the bottle. And so we put the bottle in a rubbish can held down with bricks. And there's water in the in the rubbish can, mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of plastic balls, so that when it does explode, it does make a big boom, uh -huh. and all this stuff flies out, and you get a sense mm -hmm. of what a really tiny explosion would be like. So, uh, a high school student, if she was watching this particular mm -hmm. exhibit, would 
learn a little bit about explosive volcanoes? Is you that you the, the could plan? certainly learn about vol explosive volcanoes. You could learn a little bit about chemistry, because converting from liquid to gas is a chemistry mm -hmm. process. Um, with the balls that go in the water and fly out, you could learn a little bit about physics, because they're going to fly different directions depending on whether they go straight up or off to the side. And so on. So there's really a lot to be right. to be learned. And the emphasis there. would be on a lot of the STEM sciences, which we've talked about on the show before, Certainly. in terms of math and physics and chemistry and that sort of thing. That's yeah. right. I mean, th this is a demonstration. One could do all of these experiments in a very quantitative way if if you wanted to. And presumably, the more quantitative, or more detailed, would be the kind of discussion that would be best done on the Saturday, um, partly mm -hmm. because we have many of the uh, famous scientists from UH there. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go on to the next slide, um, because I think, it's, Cindy, it's the variety which I've always been uh, most enthused about for Sost Open Houses. And with Sea Grant College, I've had people from Sea Grant on the show before, mm -hmm. but here we're seeing, I think, a number of marine exhibits, is that correct? Yes, actually the most wonderful thing about the SOAS Open House is that it goes from, you learn about everything from the absolute deep sea to the earth to the atmospheric sciences all the way up through space. Mm -hmm. So yes, we're, um, we can share information about absolutely anything that anyone is interested in. And this image here is, um, I believe this was the Seymour, uh, which was learning about um, the, the tiny little microbes in the ocean. Okay, and the next slide, I think, mm -hmm. will, will show us something about uh, uh, sea spiders. Yes. So, so that, that there's something for everybody. Absolutely. Like I was just saying, you can come and you can have hands-on exhibits for um, anything from, uh, you can touch snails and cowrie shells and um, see what critters they bring up from the very deep ocean, and there's even exhibits about humpback whales and sea turtles, and a lot and of them. presumably, you know, visitors to the open house can actually have long discussions if they so desired yes. with the research scientists who actually go and make these discoveries. Yes, I mean, the people are so enthusiastic about what they do that they really love engaging with both the students and the families and the public about the information that they're gleaning each and every day. Right, right. And now I know, Scott, you're a geologist, so I think the next image will, will show us something about uh, some, oh, looking at uh, mm -hmm. thin sections in rocks, is this mm -hmm. correct, or, or looking at something uh, similar? I was thinking we're, we'll be seeing uh, in the next slide after this one, we'll have some uh, luminescent mm. rocks. So what would you be telling a student if, if she was to come and take a look at these fluorescing rocks? I, I think you would be telling the student that certain types of minerals or certain minerals have this property of, of fluorescence. And, and if you were a geologist trying to know if one of those minerals is in a rock or not, one of the easiest things to do is to shine some ultraviolet light onto it and see whether or not that rock fluoresces. Right. And, and so, I mean, obviously, if a student's only grown up here in Hawaii, we see very few differences in the Fluorescent rocks. rocks, that's right. <laughs> to recognize that there are different types of rocks on the mainland or uh, internationally must be quite a revelation for a, a young student. Oh, I think, indeed. And I think it's important for, for students not only to learn about Hawaii itself, but to learn about other parts of the world. And you never know where you're going to end up at college or working sometime in the future. So it's, we should know about those other things. Oh, indeed. Yes, yes. And in fact, we actually have an ultraviolet light source and camera on the Mars rover. And we've looked for <laughs> ultraviolet minerals. We haven't found any yet. but <laughs> and, and for the viewing public, let me just point out that Scott is a member of one of the science teams working on the Mars uh, Curiosity rover, which is cool. right now on the surface of Mars. Right, so, are you right going to be? Minute. Are you going to be talking about that at Open House as I, well, Scott? I don't think so. I'm going to be playing with wax lava flows and demonstrating okay. a more terrestrial, terrestrial okay. thing. But we, we will get to your wax models in a minute. But I believe there are people at SOST who do Mars research. That you know, if a member of the general public was interested in planetary exploration and they came along and found you at the open house and then said, Scott, tell me more about Mars uh, Curiosity rover. 
I would do my best. You would do your exactly. best. And I would also tell them that there are many, many Mars um, displays and experts beyond me that they should go talk to as well. <laughs> so you lots of Martian You lots point of them in things. the direction of your colleagues. Yeah, I would way. certainly be happy to talk to them, but there are there are many folks who are Mars experts who right. including yourself who, who will be available. Okay. Now Cindy, um, you're in the Sea Grant program. Yes, that's right? correct. Is, is this kind of public outreach something which Sea Grant specializes in or we absolutely do. We really love taking all of the science that happens on the university campus and bringing it directly out to the general public so that they can use it and make use of it in a way that's relevant and important to them. Um, so just as one example, at the SOAS Open House on Friday and Saturday, we have an exhibit um, that's hosted by Sea Grant that's talking about the king tides. Mm -hmm. So you probably will remember just a few months ago, there was a lot of um, news and information about what Grant happened. on the show, in fact. That's right. Yes. That's right. So people can come to our Sea Grant exhibit and learn more about um, what makes king tides, why this particular summer was um, so much more, uh, the tide was higher than it had been in previous years. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, so that, that's really a specialty of Sea Grant is to take this very complex science and make sure that it's accessible and, and important to the public. And, and you're an educational coordinator for Sea Grant. That's right. I'm basically, you're, you're not doing the actual research right. yourself, so you get to go and talk to all these other scientists on a daily basis or whatever. That's right. To learn something. Now, if a member of the general public was really interested in, say, coral reefs, mm -hmm. or you mentioned sea level mm -hmm. rise, or other impacts of climate change, mm -hmm. is that the sort of time when they could come and talk to one of the scientists about this? Yes, it is. As a matter of fact, um, I mentioned that there's 90 exhibits that mm -hmm. are happening throughout, and a lot of them are focused specifically on coral reefs. A lot of them are specifically focused on sea level rise and the impacts of them. And if anyone has any questions at all about really any topic, they can take a look at the program once they get there and hone in on specific exhibits that are talking about their interests. Or they can walk around and they can just interact with the scientists and um, really ask any question that comes to mind. And, and of course, there's a welcoming booth mm -hmm. actually at Open House. Mm -hmm. Many of the people that I've had on this show in the past have come from SOST. Yes. So if the viewers are really interested in one particular aspect right. of Earth science, they can go to the information booth to start off with, find out where that particular person is located. That's so. right. And actually, they can even do that in advance if they'd like. They can go to um, the SOAS Open House website, which is which is hawaii.edu forward slash S-O-E-S-T dot Hawaii. H A W A I dot E D U forward slash open house. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds really mm -hmm. good. Well, I guess we're going to um, hear a little bit more, Scott, about the volcanology. Um, you, you've brought along a model, but we're almost at the mm -hmm. break time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, can you just tell me a little bit more about what kinds of things you're trying to explain to the, the, the viewing public when you come to uh, a volcanology experiment? Do you, Sure. I, I think everyone would understand that that volcanic eruptions and volcanic features are things that you often can't get very close to and you certainly can't control. But if you want to do some sort of experiment to understand how they work, then you need a model. You need a, a small scale, not quite as hot, not quite as big, not quite as fast version of yeah. the real thing. Sure. And, mm -hmm. and many people use such models to try and understand how lava flows advance, how lava flows cool, what makes them go where they want to go, and, and so on. Um, and so our particular display at Open House involves making quote-unquote lava flows out of wax mm -hmm. and, and flowing them, just heating them on a hot plate and pouring them from a Which pan. Which must be particularly relevant as we live in Hawaii of and course. we've got Kilauea volcano mm -hmm. going off mm -hmm. Certainly. Uh, virtually all the time and trying to understand how the landscape has been produced not only on the Big Island but presumably in the past here on Oahu as well. That's exactly right. Well, we'll come back to your experiment uh, in a few minutes time but we're almost time for the break. So let me just remind the viewers you are watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host Pete McGuinness-Mark and my guests today are Cindy Natman who is mm -hmm. an education coordinator with the UH Sea Grant mm -hmm. College and Dr. Scott Rowland, who is a professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics at yes. UH Manoa. 
and we'll be right back in about a minute's time. See you then. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. And welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness Mark, and my guests today are Cindy Natman, who is an education co coordinator at UHC Grant Program, and Dr. Scott Rowland, a professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics. And Scott, let's come back to you because you were talking a little bit about doing models of volcanic eruptions, and I believe you brought along an image of a particular experiment which you conduct at Open House. And, and can you just explain what it is we're looking at here? Sure. Uh, my two young assistants there are, are pouring melted wax onto a sloping board. And as you can see, we've, this was late in the open house from two years ago. We've been, at the time, had been pouring wax lava flows onto this slope for two days. And we had built up quite a nice shield volcano. A uh, pretty good model of what Kilauea or Mauna Loa look like, uh -huh. made of, in that case, few tens of thousands of flows, if not hundreds of thousands, not quite so many here. Um, and, and it's not shown in this image, but we have a thermal video camera that we will have set up as well. And so in addition to watching the actual wax flows go down the slope, you'll be able to look at how those flows cool with time as, as they move down the slope and just and just sit there. And that was a, a, a big example which you had at the last open house, but I believe you brought along a model. A small one. A small one. So let's just play a, a, a what if kind of situation. Explain to Cindy what it is that you're actually looking at. <laughs> All right. So this is a, a small version of the large volcano, and this was put together by a colleague of ours named Tom Shea, who is teaching a class specifically about lava flows. Um, and, and he has a little boy, and the little boy sacrificed a few of his color crayons to change <laughs> the colors a little bit. Just move it back bit. here so that we can get a zoom in. And, and I'm not sure quite how many flows are shown there, um, probably five or six episodes of, of emplacement. And you can see how the flows have moved down the slope, and they've gone around previous flows. Um, yeah. Some of them have, have gotten long and skinny, others are a little bit shorter and fatter. <laughs> and, and again, real lava flows are certainly exciting to study in, re in real life, and, and it's important to study them in real life, but many times it's not as practical. And so this would be a model of a flow emplacement process that, that would be very useful to try and understand how flows advance, how they cool, what makes them go one way or another way, and, and so on. And this would be a great analog to Kaimuki Shield, for example. It could be, the or, Kaimuki Shield, or all of Mauna Loa, or, yes. yeah. or volcanoes on Mars. There are lots of applications right. to this. Do you ever take a section through part of the model, and, and so you could see the different layers, like when we drive over to Kailua on mm -hmm. the Pali Highway, mm -hmm. there's that lovely road cutting on the right-hand side? Sure, we did exactly that last after the last open house, uh, we, we basically didn't break it apart until the whole thing was over because mm -hmm. we wanted it to look nice for everyone who came to visit. But in the process of breaking it down, we cut it into some pieces. And, and just like a real volcano exposed in a cliff, this cliff was only two inches tall, we could see all the little layers of wax that were behaving just like hmm. layers of lava. So it really was a Terrific. good analog yeah. on many levels. Cindy, yeah. do we ever see 
you know, it's, uh, students being inspired actually by coming to the open house? You know, do you have any? Absolutely. There are so many students that are already a little bit interested in science mm -hmm. that just come and really decide after being able to, like you said, talk directly to some of the researchers that are actually out there doing the science every day, and they make their connections, and they hopefully will pursue um, careers in STEM, which is yeah. science, technology, engineering, or math. And I, I would imagine that if an undergraduate who hadn't declared her major mm -hmm. yet came along to this open mm -hmm. house as well, you know, and can actually interact with um, the scientists, you know, we have like the Global Environmental Studies that's program, right. for example, that's to right. really motivate students. And that's well, and I think also that's why it's so important that we have so many graduate students and undergraduate students participating and actually having exhibits because they can really connect well with the students and say, you know, I was in your same situation just a few years ago and this is the path that I pursued and this is how much fun I'm having and look at all the cool science I get to do every Regular day. Regular viewers so. to this particular show will mm -hmm. know that I'll often ask the guests, mm -hmm. how did you get involved in this particular mm -hmm. line of work? Well, mm -hmm. I would imagine the open house itself really enables a visitor, a high school student or even parents of students to actually make this particular connection, right? It really does, yeah. So um, for me in particular, I've always loved the ocean. I grew up right next to it and uh, really in, in loved wanting to um, just tell people about it and make it important to them instead of being able to, you know, have the science happening in a, in a lab that doesn't have any application or impact on the students. Um, so yeah, I think the SOS Open House is a perfect way of doing and, that. And you say that there are 90 different exhibits. That's so let's right. randomly take a look at the next slide, sure. for example. And just talk a little bit more about the diversity. We've, we've seen this. If we can go to mm -hmm. the next slide, maybe we can uh, uh, see. So for example, um, who would like to take this one? Scott, can you tell us a little bit about, looks like we've got a rocket in the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. Sure, I, I, I hope folks know that, that UH Manoa um, has a rocketry program. I should say not rocketry. I mean, they're actually working to launch satellites into space and will be one of very few universities in the whole world with that, with that capability. And it's a joint venture between SOAS and the College of Engineering. And okay. it involves probably 100 or so students and faculty with everything from engineering to electric, electronics to physics, understanding the orbits and rockets, propulsion, and what are we going to do with the data once we start collecting them. So it's a huge enterprise and, and you know, little old UH Mono is doing it. It's yeah, pretty terrific. impressive. Yes, it's yeah, 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 yes. Yeah. And, and trying to participate in some of these space missions. You're on the Mars mission right now. I know that there are like a dozen other faculty members in SOS who are also on either planetary missions or, or satellite science teams which are currently in Earth orbit sort of thing. So, yeah, Manoa seems to be a world-class institution in many of these different fields, right? And, and in the oceanography area, we've got people who are working Station Aloha, which is this That's right. facility. Can That's you talk right. a bit more about that? Well, there'll actually be a representative from Station Aloha at this year's SOAS Open House, so they can come and talk directly to And so them. tell the viewers more. What is Station Aloha? you know a little bit about uh, that? A little bit. Station yeah. Aloha is a, a, program, a set of instruments that are attached to an undersea um, phone cable or, or mm -hmm. telecommunications cable um, out to the northeast of the Hawaiian Islands. And there are seismic data, temperature gauges, pressure gauges, uh, a number of instruments that the cable was already there because uh, it's a telecommunications cable. Um, and so it was a really great utilization of, a, of an existing resource um, for getting those kinds of oceanographic right. data from the Kind of a remote place back and to UH. the remote place is four and a half kilometers mm. uh, under or below sea level on the ocean floor, right? So oh, absolutely. This, it's, it's this is a really hard to get to. Ex exciting kind of data set. To absolutely. Start doing. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on to take another look mm. because it's the variety of open house, which I think is, is really exciting. Um, Scott, you mentioned that uh, you've got a thermal infrared camera. That mm. appears to be the image. Uh, in the background behind the young lady with the glasses, is that correct? That is that is correct. There are a number of, of utilizations of thermal cameras in earth science. 
And these folks are demonstrating one. And you can see how people have different temperatures to them. Their hands are warmer than their, their torsos. Um, if, if someone were to open their mouth, um, you would see it's pretty warm inside there. <laughs> um, on the very right-hand side of that colorful screen, you can see there's somebody with glasses on. And you can see how cool in the green color the glasses are compared to the person's head. <laughs> so thermal cameras get used in many, many different types of scientific and other applications. And, and they're really great to, to demonstrate how those, how those work. And so the, the color image we see here is probably just a, a, a crowd pleaser, but I understand that actually within SOAS, researchers are building their own thermal infrared cameras either to fly in Certainly. orbit mm -hmm. or to go and study the volcano. Mm -hmm. So that would be an entry point for a high school student to look at the actual image and say, oh, there's this literally cool or hot, um, but then there's this follow-on from the research point of view where you can really get some understanding of, well, why is a thermal infrared camera so important? Right, and, and you're right, it's a crowd pleaser, but you also have to remember who are the people giving these little demonstrations, and it's pretty hard to keep these scientists and students to not go down that road of why this is so cool and what it can be, what it can be um, applied to. So you're, you're right, it starts out as a crowd pleaser, but if, if, if all you want is a pretty picture, um, you better get away quick because you're going you're gonna to get those explanations yeah, you're pretty get soon. Drawn into That's right, the, the, the and, background and it's because everybody's so enthusiastic about, about what we do, and we really want people to understand the depth of this, these techniques and this science. We, we don't want people to have a, a superficial image of how it works. Cindy, is there any better time for people to come along? I know that it's two days and it starts early in the morning. Uh, There's you know, just come early and stay late both days? Yes, well, if you're um, a family, then I would suggest coming on Saturday instead of Friday, just because on Friday we get so many school groups that you might not have as much of an opportunity to talk directly to the faculty or the graduate students as you would on Saturday. Okay. So again, Saturday is from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Okay, and can you give us the web address? address so that people can Certainly. figure out what would be their priorities to go Certainly. And there's a map and there's the program and everything that anyone needs to know is available on the web. So it's www.soest, which is S-O-E-S-T dot Hawaii, H-A-W-A-I-I dot E-D-U forward slash open house. Excellent. And, everything and, is and on that there. will describe all of the different exhibits. That's and correct. presumably it's the same material on both days, but yes. in more detail probably on the Saturday. That's right. And for each of the 90 exhibits, there's a sentence or two in uh, informational um, you okay. know, about Okay, And what everybody, it is, so. Scott, will come and see your wax volcano. Is well, that the plan? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully everybody will see certainly something that, that really something grabs that them. Excite something them. that really excites them. That's right. Yeah. Well, it sounds terrific. We're going to be doing a live broadcast from the first half hour or so of Soast Open House on this coming Friday. So hopefully we'll get a chance to come in and see some of the exhibits. But unfortunately, we're out of time. So uh, let me just remind our viewers that you have been watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I've been your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and my guests today have been Cindy Natman from UH. C Grant Program and Dr. Scott Rowland from the Department of Geology and Geophysics. And let me remind you, this coming Friday and Saturday, go to the Soast Open House. You'll have lots of fun and learn an awful lot about mm -hmm. Earth science. So thanks for watching and see you again next week. Goodbye. Well done, folks. Yeah, it was really quick. <laughs>
Um, want to read a script? You may have heard of a teleprompter. So sometimes that one's there. And then this is the screen which we look at when we're actually talking about some of the pictures, right? Oh, the pictures. Yeah. And this can 